Hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly webinar. My name is Justin Cooper. I'm a hard money lender and full-time real estate investor and a real estate investor coach and consultant. Each month, we bring in some of our friends in the industry to share their expertise. This may be through a presentation, like when we talk about self-directed IRAs or title insurance, or you may simply interview our expert friends and dive deep into how they got started, where their investing has taken them, and what they see coming both for themselves and for the industry. Now, I want to say thank you to everyone who made it to tonight's event. We know that you're giving up some of your time, so Nick and I will do everything we can to bring you the value that you're hoping for. And tonight should be pretty easy since we're talking about a very relevant topic, property management. This webinar is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial is Colorado and Minnesota's premier hard money lender. Pine focuses on the needs of Colorado and Minnesota real estate investors. We're investors ourselves, and we know what it takes to get deals closed. Everyone at Pine Financial Group is dedicated to the success of its clients. We only experience success when our clients are succeeding. So we have a habit of telling you when a deal should or should not be done. And isn't that what you want from a professional in the industry, especially someone that you trust as an advisor? You will benefit from our honesty and integrity when you choose to work with us. Now, we've got two upcoming events I want to talk to you briefly about. Um, I want to make sure you're getting these on your calendar uh, and depending on where you're located. So we have our Investor Success Summit uh, just around the corner. In Minnesota, the Investor Success Summit is coming up on Saturday, September 28th. And in Denver, the event will be Saturday, October 12th. So if you want to learn more about where the events are going to be, who some of the speakers are going to be, uh, what the day is going to look like. Uh, in Minnesota, you can head over to www.mniss.com. <clears throat> so as in Minnesota Investor Success Summit, mniss.com. And for Denver, it's going to be at www.denveriss.com. Tonight's webinar is near and dear to my heart. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the hidden profits in using a property manager. When I first turned my first property over to a property manager, I almost immediately saved or really made over $7,000. Uh, and so along those lines, I'm excited to introduce Nick Mertens of Atlas Real Estate Group, as he is one of the folks that helped me on that first property and several more since. Nick Martins is the Vice President of Property Management at Atlas Real Estate Group, a local investment brokerage and property management company with offices in Denver, Colorado Springs, uh, and now Phoenix, Arizona. Atlas has invested over $60 million into its own investments and therefore understands investing and management firsthand. Their property management business arose out of the need to have a property management company that understood how to manage a property like an owner, not like a manager. So they designed the company around driving the results they wanted to see in their own assets. Atlas has won Best Property Management Company in Denver for the past three years, and in 2019, uh, they won the Best Places to Work from the Denver Business Journal. Atlas continues to grow thanks to clients' referrals and smart, hard work. Uh, Nick, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive into tonight's topic? Yeah, I don't even know if I need to. You just told it all. I feel like that was a mic drop. That was a really good job, Justin. Thank you. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Nick Mertens, guys. Uh, as, as Justin said, I run our um, property management division locally in uh, uh, Denver, Front Range area. Now we have a new office in Phoenix, which I'm actually sitting in right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I started off uh, myself before Atlas is doing fix and flip, flips with my dad and uh, wasn't doing a great job at it. Learned learned a couple of things from the guys at Atlas and teamed up with them. And we are in need of uh, in need of making better profits on the on the buy and holds that we are we are managing. So we kind of created a, a property management division based around driving results, um, keep turn times low, vacancy costs low, um, you know ev everything that you hear of. And uh, Justin and I were talking, and um, yeah, just, Justin, uh, Justin turned his properties over to us a while ago, and, and we were able to help him boost his profits. And he said, you know, this sounds like a great a great thing to do a webinar about, so let's bring it to our audience, and uh, that's, that's kind of how we got here today. Yeah, exactly. And so for everybody on the webinar, uh, as we go through, Nick really loves to get some interaction from the folks that he's presenting to. So when you have any questions at any time, feel free and jump into the questions section and just go ahead and type it in there. Uh, I will be um, going through those questions and interrupting Nick as it makes sense 
Sometimes I'll just type in a quick answer. Sometimes I'll interrupt Nick. Uh, and then depending on the question, um, usually if it's a little too personal of a situation, we'll just wait till the end or uh, take that question offline. So feel free at any time to jump right into that question section and type in any questions you guys might have. So um, as we started this out, I mean, I think the reason to even begin this, this content is that most people immediately think of, you know, especially if you own just a few properties, they think of a property manager as somebody who's just going to mingle, get in and steal money out of their profits. And uh, I think that what you can, what you'll learn or maybe take away from this experience is that um, if you pick the right property manager, they can actually be a humongous asset and help you drive uh, your results and make more money at the end of the day. So let's go ahead and jump in here a little bit. Uh, feel free to feel free, like Justin said, to ask questions or poke fun at me. Um, I really love interaction and it definitely makes this a, a more fun job to do here. So, um, so just some things to start with. Uh, just what investors are after. Um, as an investor myself, uh, we've definitely. We definitely see a disparity in what you guys want versus what somebody who's hired as a property manager needs to. So um, you're looking for a good teammate and a good steward. So we'll start here. Um, so as you, as you guys are analyzing deals, there's a few things that people look for. They're looking for cash flow, value add plays, appreciation. Whoever your PM is or whatever you're doing, you should make sure you're partnering and centering around what your goals are. Um, once you've picked it, you got to make the numbers work because at the end of the day, I mean, you're buying a rental property uh, for profit. So let's talk about how to drive and make the best profit possible. So what makes a good teammate? Uh, someone who owns a property and understands it from an investment standpoint. So um, if you're interviewing property managers, whether it sounds like we have people um, coming in from, from Minnesota and other parts of the U.S., you absolutely want to hire somebody who understands it ground level. I mean, when you have, when, you, when you're cutting your teeth in your own business and, uh, you know, you call somebody out of the phone book because you need something done real quick and all of a sudden you get this bill that's double or triple what it means. It can, it can crush your cash flow for the entire year. So um, somebody who understands what it means to make the right calls, call the right people is, is absolutely crucial. Um, you want somebody whose interests are aligned with your own and uh, somebody who is able to protect and shield you from pain points. Um, so you, you really want somebody who's, who's, who's been in your shoes before in the situation and is, is an expert. Um, so let's start to talk about some of the big things that can help you just immediately gain, gain money. Obviously, there's the simple things um, that any, any expert will do, which is a good market analysis and raising rents. But uh, what you're looking for... I think at the end of the day is um, what, what I hear most often and people griping about their property managers is, you know, this, this, this guy just kind of went haywire with my money. He left the tenants in, he didn't increase the rents. Uh, you know, she didn't do X, Y, or Z. And so there's some basic things I think at the end of the day, um, which I'm going to try to break this down into way, way basic things are in situational things that can help drive your economics. Um, and the, the first being, um, just, just let's talk about turns. So, um, I think that what I see the average PM doing in Denver is a unit, they get, they get a, a notice to vacate 30 days ahead of time. The tenant moves out and maybe on the first of the month, the tenant moves out the 30th, the, the, on the first of the month, they are going to the property to look it over and see what needs to be done. And at this point in time, they're creating a minor turn scope, they're turning it around and they're sending off a bid to the owner, typically five days later. And the owner approves it, and then it takes another week or two to, con to get the contractors and they're due to the work. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're starting your, your work on the first or, or shortly thereafter, everybody and, their, everybody and their brother are already on a job that was contracted out before that, because they're always at least two weeks out from what they're doing. Um, and so, so really, you, you see most PM companies coming and telling you, hey, your economic vacancy is always going to be a, a month out from when somebody moves out. And I just don't understand the point or the need for that. So um, a good manager should be heading to your building when they receive that 30-day notice to quit. Um, so a typical thing for us might be 
the manager has to be over there within the five days of receiving that. And they're going to create a turn scope and a budget and put the, uh, put the, uh, the, the whole, the whole thing together and start pre-marketing. So if, if the unit's in good enough condition to use photos and, and set the thing up, then they can pre-market it and really start to show the unit before it ever goes vacant. There's a few things that go into that. A, you have to know um, what to expect on a turn time. So if you're lining up a crew or if you're piecing together vendors, you need to be able to accurately uh, accurately place, hey, it's going to be a day to fix up odds and ends. It's going to be um, two days to paint the entire unit, a day and a half to rip out the old carpet, lay a vinyl plank, and, 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 and create a solid move-in date. But if you know all that, or if you have a finished product next door which you use pictures on, it's really simple to go ahead and get it marketed. And what we find is that if that you do that, if it needs very little, like say a day's worth of turnaround, you can have zero vacancy between one tenant and next because you you lease it somewhere one to two weeks before the old tenant ever moves out. Um, and if it needs a bigger turn, you can you can space it out and put that person in there. So if you think about that compared to the average PM or to what somebody scrambling around to find a vendor might might do because that vendor's two weeks out you're saving yourself anywhere from two to four weeks worth of rent if your rent's a thousand bucks a month or two thousand dollars a month even and you're after you pay all your expenses you're making 300 bucks a month total you're, you're saving yourself a ton of profit profit for the entire year or so um so pre-marketing is humongous um in marketing the right sources um Go on the list here, screening. Screening, I don't think can be talked about enough. I mean, it's a very basic concept. Everything we're gonna talk about today, as far as property management goes, if you think about it in one step, each step is very basic. But, um, you know, making sure that you have the best tenant you can, I mean, that's that's like 80% of the game right there. If you have somebody who's gonna trash the unit, somebody who's gonna stay only for a year, um, you know, somebody who doesn't have great credit and or a stable job, and uh, ditches out ahead of time that just causes you grief and, and causes your your time with the tenant to to just to just tank. So, um, but you know any any PMU you should have good screening criteria. You should ask them what it is. Um, you know the every typically will tell you they need to have X amount of credit score. Um, they need to have no evictions and no felonies, et cetera. Um, it's good to also have them verify with the previous landlord and get a reference. I, I can't tell you how many times that's saved me from renting some, somebody because they're like, absolutely not. This is horrific. And if you can get their old manager ready, it's even uh, two managers ago, it's even, you, you get even better data because they have no skin in the game on whether they leave or not. So um, that can be really huge, but I think, uh, Tenant placement is, is a large part of the game and, and should never be overlooked. So it matters quite a bit. Um, yeah, so that all leads to low economic vacancy and a quick turn time. Um, is there any questions about that or like how to how to line some of that stuff up to to help it the turn go quickly? Uh, well, so I've got some two cents to add here. Uh, this is basically exactly what had happened when I turned over that first property to you uh, and, and what you guys had done. So um, I was having issues with my tenants and they were um, complaining about this was broken and that was leaking and all these other things. And, um, and it was eventually time for them to go and for us to part ways. And so I said, hey, uh, you know, Nick, it is time to bring in a property manager on this property here's what I think we're up against, right? They're moving out on this day uh, and I'm expecting some plumbing repairs and we have to find this leak and we have to do these things. So that's what I'm expecting. Uh, and what you guys did was you reached out right away to the current tenant and said, hey, I know you're moving out. Uh, love to get in there and just you know, start showing the property if we can and get a baseline. Uh, and so you did, and then you started marketing the property. You found a tenant uh, who was willing to move in the day after my tenant moved out uh, and uh, at higher rent. So first off, right there, right? So no lost time. Um, but then also as you were going through that process, as my tenant moved out and as the new one came, moved in, you know, you guys did a great job of communicating with the new tenant saying, hey, there might be some repairs, be on the lookout for these things. 
Uh, and But as we were going through the motions, we realized that really there was nothing wrong. It was just some weird way that the tenant was living was causing some of these issues, but there was no real deficiencies in the property. Uh, where I was planning on having, you know, a month or two of vacancy, probably ripping open walls to try and find these uh, uh, leaks, you guys got in there and just because of how much experience you guys have and knowing what to be looking for and how to be interacting with uh, tenants and stuff, there was really uh, no downtime and there was no uh, massive expense in turnover because uh, in remodeling because there was really nothing wrong with the property. So um, I'm, I'm glad you kind of hit this one first because for me, this certainly was uh, one of the biggest reasons and something that really made me all of a sudden much more comfortable uh, and feeling much more profitable in diving into a property manager. Um, okay, so we've got a couple questions here. <clears throat> Julie wants to know if you guys manage properties down in Pueblo. We do not manage in Pueblo at the moment, no. Not we, in Pueblo. Yeah, gotcha. we do. We're in Colorado Springs, Fountain, Castle Rock, like the whole I-25 corridor, but then uh, we pretty much stop at about Fountain. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. All right. Andrew wants to know, what's the best place to market your properties? I'm so, assuming, Andrew, you're talking about where to uh, market the properties, meaning to find tenants? Andrew, what state are you in? Are you in Colorado? Well, for the moment, let's assume so. And uh, yeah, there he is. Yes, he's in Colorado. Yeah, so my personal opinion is, I mean, like, we market to about 40 different websites, and the majority of traffic flow we get is from the Zillow group, which is Zillow, Truly, and Hot Pads. Like 80% of our leads come off of there. Um, we, we do get a decent amount from apartments.com um, and rent, uh, Rently and a few other sites, but that's it, you know, and, and some of it, some of it matters economically. Um, I always look at if you, if you're marketing a unit, um, under $1,200, you put it on Craigslist, and if it's going to be over twelve hundred dollars, you don't. Um, just kind of, just kind of helps you. We just, I don't know why there there seems to be an economic indicator that changes where it's a better site to go on, but I would say that's your best, your best option there. Gotcha. And how about Craigslist? Craigslist, Craigslist. I, I I usually say you use it on on um, the cheaper end properties. You seem, you know, if you put if you put like a thousand dollar unit on Zillow, it doesn't seem to get a lot of hits. But if you put it on Craigslist, you'll you'll get like forty in an hour. And then if you flip that over and you put a three thousand dollar unit on on Craigslist, you'll never get a hit. But you'll you'll get traction on Zillow, Hot Pads, Julia. So, yeah. Gotcha. And can you say one more time what uh, what cities and areas you do cover in Colorado? Sure, we do we do um, everything from Fort on uh, I twenty five South, everything Fort Collins, Colorado Springs. Um, we do Boulder, the surrounding area, Longmont area, etc. We manage all of the C four seventy loop and outside of it a little bit and. Uh, and then we have we manage about a thousand units in Colorado Springs and Fountain area right now as well. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Next slide here. Um, so we started to talk about turns. Something that I think gets missed a lot in, in turns and that uh, isn't always lined up well is like knowing how long a project should take or knowing your crews well enough to be able to. To, to plan things efficiently. When I think about a uh, time factor and a turn, um, let's just take a, let's just, for, for ease, ease and simplicity, let's just take like a two bedroom, one bath apartment unit in there or condo or whatever um, in, in, into it for the situation. So if I walk into a, a unit and I see that it needs a full paint, it needs cabinets painted, it needs hardware replaced. Um, the flooring is 10 years old or 12 years old and it's, you know, it's pretty crusty needs to be done I'm looking at this going okay this needs a decent size flip maybe you're going to put a new vanity in the way to keep your turn your turn times down and keep you in guard against uh, economic vacancy is to just line things up so they fall down in a row and a lot of people will hire one vendor and just put them on the entire job and, and in my opinion that's like just burning time if you hire a guy who's going to go in there and, and drop in the new vanity and the new mirror 
and he's going to do all the little touch up and the fix it stuff. He can do that while uh, the painters are in there spraying and padding and going. And um, you know, if you if you need holes patched, etc., obviously you got to do that before the painters come in. But there's a, there's a step by step lineup that can make it very efficient. I mean, I've done over 500 fix and flips, and uh, you know, you start to get those fix and flips down to 30 days uh, on a single family house that needs some serious renovation. You can just imagine how you can boost that into a smaller smaller unit or a smaller project so just um when you're looking at your managers their their depth of knowledge and how to line this stuff up should just match so if it's cheapest if it's cheapest to hire it's almost never cheap cheaper cheapest just to hire one contractor to do it if you hire somebody to do the little putsy handyman work and then at the same time you lay it over with somebody who's doing painting they can work in tandem at the same time and once they're out you put the carpet guy in or the or the vinyl plank guy or you know wherever you are what, what style four you want to put in to finish and then clean last you you can knock out a, a complete two bedroom one bath turn in you know six to seven days so what you really want to be able to do is to, to to have somebody help know how to time that out and and what it's all about and then i guess we already started to talk about marketing um you know we talked a little bit about the pre-marketing but at the same time as turns going on or well before the turn if the marketing's up and going um you know you're you're again creating t uh less less time on market more options more people seeing your property um you know there's there's the rental analysis that goes into that anytime so the way we we work this is whether it's a turn or whether it's a renewal Anytime somebody's coming up to, to move out or, or to be renewed, we're going to do a new market analysis on that property. Check check to see what things are going for in the surrounding neighborhoods that are comparable. It's the same as any sales process would be for a house, only it's done on a rental basis. And uh, and if you can do a quick turnaround on that and get it up and going, it's great. Um, the more Obviously, the more sites you can send your broadcast out to, the bigger fish net you have, the more fish you catch. So um, I think something that a lot of PMs have is syndication software that will allow them to broadcast to lots and lots and lots of different channels with ease. And they might even be able to stamp and brand or or other components. They might be able to easily take uh, uh, virtual tours and upload virtual tours of your property into their marketing so that, um, especially in Denver, we have all those relocations. I know that the amount of time somebody's called me and be like, hey, I'm calling from Florida. I don't know if, uh, I, it's, it looks like a good property. Can you tell me more about it? I mean, there's been times where we've been able to just send them a virtual tour or say, hey, look, I'm gonna go tour the property tonight at, at four. Can I call you via FaceTime? And they say, yeah, and you can walk around the building. So there's there's a million components like that that you don't think about when you're, when you're thinking about using a property management company and their ability to broadcast there. Uh, vendor cost is humongous. Um, I'm going to put a caveat on this because I uh, I believe a lot of PM, like 85% of PM companies, this is probably the biggest pain point for most owners. Um, most PM companies have their own uh, uh, construction company inside the thing and they use it as a revenue stream. So what I would say is if you have somebody who does that, if they have a good hourly rate, that's okay. If they don't, I would caution you against ever using them. If they um, if they mark up the maintenance at all, I mean, it's just I just don't understand it because it's conflict of interest to me. If I'm going to tell you what's wrong with your property and I'm making a profit stream off of it, it seems, seems wrong to have me wearing both of those hats at the same time. So a good property manager will keep your vendor costs low. Um, they can do some multiple ways. I look at a turn and I go, okay, um, I use this guy, every these four guys every time for paint. I use this guy for carpeting, blah, blah, blah. We end up getting stock discounts, you know, so there's special Atlas pricing for how much this carpet and pad cost to install, you know? So, um, you know, maybe we're looking at like $12 a square yard carpet pad and all installation, tear out, go away. You're looking at vinyl plank at this much and, and you start to get these specialized prices from these vendors because you're giving them volume discounts. I call it the subway sandwich theory. You're just hustling the subways to get you know, that those sub sandwiches to make uh, to make everything cheap, but you, you're getting volume plays. So, and then again, they should have um, in-house handymen or handymen at their beck and call that can come and fix problems as needed. 
I look at uh, on, a, on a turn, you know, you're not going to send a plumber in to replace a uh, faucet. You can send a handyman to do that. So somebody who really understands the cost analysis and spread can save you a ton in turn, turn costs all by itself. And so Nick, uh, yeah. do you charge, so do you charge any fees on top of the actual repair costs? We do not. The, um, I, sh I should put a caveat on that. We have had people ask us to flip entire houses to the tune of like twenty to fifty thousand dollars, and if somebody's asking us to do a large scale project, we're essentially acting—we're not GCs, but say we're acting like a GC, and we're we're um, making sure all the vendors align up and doing everything. And it's, and it's a gigantic project. Then we will talk to the owner ahead of time. Say we're happy to do this for you, but we do believe we should earn a little fee on this, and and uh, we make sure that they're okay with that before we go ahead. Gotcha. Uh, and now there's another question asking about uh, what is the Colorado law on how often carpets need to be replaced and how often walls need to be painted? There is not a law that determines how often they need to be replaced or painted. There is a lot when you're, um, if you're conducting a move out and you're going to charge a tenant for say replacement or call, uh, of carpet or walls, there is there is laws that are, they're very broad, that it doesn't define a time period, but they what they want you to do more is to depreciate the time they're living there. So say you have 12 year old carpets and your tenant moves in and moves out a year later, you're, they're probably not gonna want you to charge you for damages to the carpet, which, um, you know, but if you, if, they, if you have brand new carpet and they live for two years and trash it, they want you to have like, something you can show that would show depreciation on it. So say the, that carpet you believe should have lasted seven years for normal wear and tear, and they killed it in two years, and you can charge them for five-sevenths of the carpet is kind of the way that Colorado looks at that. Um, and same with paint. There's really there's really no law. I mean, I've walked into properties that have had the same carpet for 20 years, and they still look great. Um, and then I've walked into properties that, you know, somebody trashes it in, in six months. So so there's no law governing it. Gotcha. Um, so here's a question. <clears throat> Where is it here? How do you handle scammers stealing pictures and marketing your properties? Yeah, so that's uh, that that becomes a bigger and bigger issue as time goes on. Um, fortunately, we do pretty well on this. I think most of the scams that are taken are put up on Craigslist. Um, and we don't, like, as I was saying earlier, we don't have an issue happen often. We've had it happen once or twice using a Zillow ad. And what you can do is, the good thing about Zillow is if there's dual ads placed, it will shut both of them down. So if, if like, what we'll see is we'll be having good traffic flow, 8 to 12, 12 leads a day, and all of a sudden we see nothing. And so rather than going into our ad and going, oh, yeah, it's posted, we go and pretend like we're a consumer looking for the product. And if it's not there, then most of the time what happens, somebody try to scam our ad and repost it. There is times that people scam it and put it on Craigslist. And usually what ends up happening is, um, you know, is that if that happens and uh, somebody, somebody shows up at the property and they're like, hey, I'm supposed to meet so-and-so here. I gave them money and I don't know how to guard against that. I really don't. Like we do everything we can to protect against it. And I think out of the three thousand properties we manage now in the like eight years I've been doing this, we've only had that happen twice where we've had somebody show up at a house and tell us that they paid somebody random, you know, a uh, 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 security deposit and moving fee. What I can say is that it's hard because every time I've seen one of those scams come through, it's it's like a too good to be true concept. Like a yeah, well, they said this house, you know, this house was rent for rent for twelve hundred bucks. I'm like, this is a twenty seven hundred dollar a month house, and like, if you look at any of the other houses in the neighborhood, you know, this isn't a twelve hundred dollar a month house. But there's there's no way to protect consumer against that. It's just a caveat, MTAR. Gotcha. Uh, and now you had briefly mentioned how many properties you manage, but that was a question I was going to bring up later. Somebody asked, yeah. how many properties do you manage? We currently manage a, a little over 3,000. Um, the majority of them are in the, the Denver metro area um, with probably about mm, 17, 1,800, somewhere between um, Boulder and South Denver. And we manage another 1,000 in Colorado Springs and the, the rest are out here in Phoenix. Gotcha. Um, got two questions. One's a little bit longer here, so Stay with me. 
<coughs> what can a property owner do when a property manager has not done their due diligence, not putting in quality tenants, not insured uh, the payments of rents and utilities each month, not not kept the owner appraised of issues when the owner uh, when the owner said that they should evict, um, but that they couldn't. Uh, basically, how does uh, a, uh, an investor, a property owner, deal with um, a property manager when things are not going uh, as planned or or as well as they should? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's that's a hard question. I think the best thing you can do is to guard against that preemptively by having a really good PM agreement with the manager. Um, some people will allow you to change their PM agreement. Some won't, but the laws governing what you can and can't do are going to be all governed through whatever agreement you came to in that PM agreement. So read it through carefully. And if you don't like something in it, see if you can change it. And if you really don't like something in it, go with a different PM company if they won't change it for you. That's about the first thing you can do and about the best thing you can do. If you're already in the situation and they're putting in bad tenants and you believe it's an issue of non-performance, um, you should try to break your contract with them and go hire somebody else. There isn't much you can do to come back after them um, for lost rents, non-collected things, um, except for to to break the contract due to non-performance. And, um, you know, some of the, so I've seen, I don't know, 50 or 60 different PM agreements from different companies. And you really need to be aware of what those say for if you decide to break the contract too, because some people try to make you pay them whatever percentage fees you would owe for rent for the rest of the year until that contract's actually over. So the, again, that goes back to safeguarding at the, at the, up front with a good PM contract. Um, but in my opinion, if anybody's worth their salt and you say, hey, I, I don't want to work with you anymore, they should they should break that with you. That un unfortunately isn't always the case and they won't always do that. Is that does that answer the question? Or is there anything I can add to that or that you would like me to add uh, on top of that? Uh, Jennifer, what do you think? Was that, did it point you in the right direction? Let's see. Well, as we wait for Jennifer to say if that fully answers your question, uh, I got another one here. Uh, what do you think about not raising rents on good, really good, long-term renters? They've been in there for maybe four years or more so. Um, yeah, this is this so is always a question that goes back to the owner. Um, so there's there's the there's, there's different reasons to do each one. And I, I think what we try to do when we do renewals and rent raises is to kind of speak with the owners ahead of time about a game plan and solidify it with them. Um, and as an owner myself, sometimes, uh, even if I have great tenants, there's, there's sometimes there's reason to, to, to raise the rents anyway, even if it risks pushing them out. There's other times to like meet them in the middle. There's other times to just leave it alone. So if you have great tenants, but they're $400 under market rent, I mean, you think about that, you really might really like your tenants, but that's almost a 5K loss for you every year that you're not collecting just because you like them. And, and from a business standpoint, it's not necessarily always the best option. Now, on the other hand, on my own property, you know, I've had a tenant who is two or $300 under market rent. And at the moment, I didn't really want to go ahead and spend, like I bought it with that tenant in place, knew that. Um, knew that they were, when, when they moved out, I was going to have at least a 12K turn on my hands that had been done in eons and it was a large property. And so I look at that and I was like, I'm okay losing a couple, a couple hundred bucks a month right now because I, I don't really want to eat that $12,000. So my opinion is, is you need to do what's, what makes best business sense for you as, as the owner. Um, and your manager should guide you on what their opinion is, but at the end of the day, you should make the decision there. Gotcha. Uh, is there any like ramifications if you haven't raised rents in so long and then all of a sudden you try raising them? Is there um, anything that would prevent you from doing that or want to? No, there's, no, there's no legal ramifications. There's There's been talk about putting caps on it, but currently there isn't caps on it. Um, 
So uh, legal legal caps on it, so on how much you can push it up. So what, what I would say is what we do to kind of help with that scenario is say somebody's got a $300 disparency. We don't really want to lose them, um, but it's close enough. What we'll do is put the, uh, the renewal notice in the mail and then three days after, or and then maybe just text it and say, hey, just an FYI, renewals went out. Give me a call when you get here so we can discuss it. If they don't call them, we'll call them and, and just check and say, hey, are you planning on renewing or not? And if they like start to get all upset about rent rates, you might already have a preconceived notion in your head of what you're willing to work with them to. So if it's, you know, if they're, if that $300 is going to boot them out, but they'll, they're willing to meet that $150 or $200 on the increase, and they understand that the market rents in the neighborhood are much higher. Sometimes you can do that and you can save the tenant, still get the owner a bunch more money than they're already making. And, and nobody's really mad about it at the end of the day. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So um, this next slide is called uh, tenant issues. Um, everybody, ha I, I actually think that the the position is, is wrongly named. It shouldn't be called property management. It should be called people management because I'd say it's 85% people management, 15% asset preservation, um, but we call it property management anyway. So there's there's a lot of things that lead into this. Um, everybody has that one tenant who won't stop calling them night or day, um, or they've had they've had that bad placement where they're like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have put that person in, and I did anyway. Now I'm reaping, you know, the results. There's the midnight maintenance calls that are, you you know, maybe you do need to take them. Maybe there's an active week. And it's like, hey, we need this fixed ASAP, or maybe it's like a, hey, my garbage disposal is broken. You know, so there's there's all these tenants that can get in the way. There's two or three sides to that. Um, one, I think a good property manager will. Like, I just look at this in like numbers of headaches. A good property manager will will train their tenants to work around their schedule, call them for emergencies only after hours, etc. You know. Um, and if, if you don't do this every day and it's just like something you do on the side that that can just cause you grief. Um, I, I know when I was younger, my property management life, my wife used to get just mad at me about the dinner or playing with the kids or something. And I'd get this 911 call and a lot, you know, when I first started before I learned to train people, it was like, okay, you start answering everything. You, th you think everybody's, everything's a big issue. And it's not. So Good manager, I mean, it's, that's an intangible, maybe it's not a, a, a cost benefit, but it's a huge benefit to having them deal with that and train the tenants appropriately. Um, setting expectations is similar. Um, just tenant friendships and business, that goes back to what we were just talking about, like, hey, I have this great tenant, I haven't raised rent some in four years, and now we're way under market value. Good property manager usually won't let that happen. They'll raise it a little bit every year, even if it's not so full market value, keep the tenant, but they'll still be making you more money. Um, and I know that a lot of, a lot of, uh, self, self managers, you know, they've had tenants for five, 10, 15 years and they've become good friends with them. And it, it can create some pretty big, um, heartache and headache when it, when, when things don't go well with tenants. So, uh, a good property manager acts as a buffer between you and that tenant. And of course there's the liability issues, um, that, you know, if, if it's something broken on the house, that's a different story but there's all the liability issues that can go with being a, a manager a landlord and they just seem to just seem to grow every year um you know as as laws change and things happen and um you know so a good property manager understands liability they've taken courses on um on on what they can and can't do what's uh discrimination what's ethical and so there's all these pieces there that, that, that can help guard you against liability that a professional will have. Um, there's usually a million little tiny questions surrounding this. So if there's any big ones, that's great. If not, we could if we could save it to the end, that would be great. Um, any, anything you want to pop in here, Justin? Uh, yeah, so got a quick question. How often do you recommend doing a walkthrough of your properties? Sure. So um, I think a minimal of two times a year is good. I think doing more than four deserves a tenant to the point where like the tenant has to feel like it's their property too, right? You're leasing them the right to the property. But I think, I think two, two is pretty great for a single family home. Um, if you're at a, if you have a multifamily, 
I think of the individual units, again, I'd go back to two or two to four at the most, but I would do the common areas, especially like the boiler rooms and stuff. They sh that should happen almost weekly. I'm um, at a very minimal to small multifamily. Gotcha. And so Kristen wants to know, how should you expect to pay a property manager? Uh, are you asking how much, Kristen? Or are you asking how, how the transaction works? <laughs> she says, sure. So maybe both. Maybe how does the transaction work? And then, you know, maybe what's a uh, normal amount to pay a, a property manager? Sure. Um, so, so transactionally, usually what happens is they collect your rents and then um, this can be done in a variety of different ways. I've seen a ton of different businesses handle this um, differently, but let me just tell you that the normal, the normal 85% of the way that this is done is that uh, your tenant pays your rent on the first, your property manager holds the rent for the entire month and uses that as an operating account. I'll come back to why they do that in a second. But, um, and then the first of the next month, they start processing reports and then they pay you out sometime in the next week or two, your, your, uh, your proceeds and they'll take out any repairs that were done. They'll take out their management fees and then they'll forward you the rest with a report. And most of them, We'll put it directly in your account if you have direct deposit or they'll cut you a check if that's what you wish. So, and the, uh, the reason that they generally hold it as an operating account for a month is because the way that DORA and the Colorado Commission looks at, at uh, trust accounts is if you have a trust account and you're holding money for say 100 different owners, one of them has a negative account they look at it as like you're borrowing money from the other owners to cover that person's negative account without their permission. So most, so rather than asking for giant reserve funds or for calling an owner every time anything happens, to have it funded before they can fix it, most companies just opt to hold it because it's the easiest way of guarding against that problem. So that's how most, most of the time the transaction works. Um, the fees can be all over the board. I mean, it, that depends on, for each company, it can be different depending on how they set things up. Um, if it's a single family, it can be different than if it's a large scale multifamily. Like, I mean, what you'd pay in a 200 unit building percentage wise or per door wise will be completely different than a single family. But if we're, let's just say for the type of conversation, I think probably most of our audience is in the like zero to 15 unit category, um, probably single family and condos. Um, you're going to pay a base management fee of anywhere from six to twelve percent, with like eight to nine percent being your normal and average. Um, and then you're probably going to pay some sort of a leasing fee and a renewal fee. Um, look really well through your contract, and also ask for a lease agreement when you're looking at these terms. Because what I've seen is like maybe you pay, uh, you you might pay a percentage management fee and then a lease up fee, but then you can look through the the PM uh, the the lease packet and tenants also paying that manager a lease up fee, which sometimes just comes out of security deposit, which if they default is like almost like stealing money from you. So be careful on that. Um, some will charge you for all maintenance costs. They'll charge you surcharges. Some will, some will take posting fees. Some will, you know, there's, there's so many different ways that people will nickel and dime and skin stuff in there. So if I were you, what I would do when you're looking at a PM agreement is take all those little tiny fees and add them up to see what the effective management fee is because um, it can it can vary greatly from person to person. I know that is not a very direct answer, but it's it's an honest one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see here. So obviously, uh, um, so liability. Liability, this comes in multiple waves. Uh, it comes from knowing the law to helping maintain um, your asset, to strong leases, background checks, just the experience that we have every day, um, legal issues, fair housing. I, I look at liability, outside of economic vacancy, I look at liability as probably like the most expensive thing that can happen to you is if you know, you, you don't react to something in, in the right way and it causes you a lawsuit. So um, property managers are trained in this, they're trained in how to, how to best operate in a situation, how to fix something in a timely way, how to, how to you know, steer something so that, uh, steer's not the right word, but how, how, to, how to make sure that a situation can get de-escalated and uh, 
and they can take care of the tenants' needs without causing any legal battles. So um, this this can be gigantic. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've known somebody to manage their own property for five, six, seven years, and they're like, "This is easy," and then they have that one time where they get into a, an argument with their tenant and it turns into a legal issue, and they're calling me and they're like, "I don't know what to do with this now. Help me." And uh, and and so a, a property manager is a, a, a great buffer between you and the tenant and all the liability. Um, so as uh you know as justin justin works for pine i, I kind of figured a lot of you do flips and what have you in that nature maybe you do short-term holds and you uh you you know you, you you build off appreciation and things like that i think i think one of the things that people forget about a good property manager is just the asset preservation in and of itself um you know if you have a if you're managing, let's say you have a unit out of state or something, and, and you you stop in once a year and you check on it, it looks fine. There's going to be issues that you never know about that will slowly go downhill over time. And you go to sell it, you might have a huge bill at the end. Or, um, you know, I think about I think about the amount of times that I've like gone into a unit inspection, and tenants are like, yeah, everything's fine. You go inside and like you turn the water on the sink and you put your hand up by the pee trap and it's just leaking, you know, and that leak's been there for I don't know, three months already at this point. At six months, you know, you're removing the base of the cabinet and there's this black mold everywhere. So there's 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 a lot of these little things that you just don't think about that a, a trained property manager is going to go and protect you against. It's like an upfront cost. So, okay, so it, it you know, it cost them 50 cents to go get a new O-ring and I sent the guy over there. It's been half an hour to drop it off. So you have this little upfront cost that saves you from serious future issues. Um, a lot of things, something I see a lot of times we take over properties are like broken gutters and the water flowing back towards the, back towards the unit, some negative grading or something like that, that ends up flooding the basement. So things that they're trained and looking at to stop and prevent to, to, to get in front of the situation before it ever happens. Um, a good, a good PM company should also be doing early inspections and this should be like a hundred point inspection or something like that. And the evals of the property, they can also, something that you probably don't think about is what they can also do is tell you what, you know, economically, what your, what your, what, how your rents are affected by your current rate of your house. I mean, I can't tell you how often I see somebody who's got, they bought a house eight years ago for 200 grand. And they're making a lot of money on it right now because they bought it for 200 grand and their mortgage is like $1,100 and rents are $2,000. But the house is worth 500 grand and they only owe 100 grand on it at this point in time or something like that. So they have $400,000 in cap and lazy equity just sitting in the house that they're not doing anything with. And, and they're, they're happy because they're making, you know, 800 bucks a month or whatever. So a good property manager might just let you know, like, hey, um, just so you know, your house is worth this much right now. If you were to reinvest that, you know, let's say 25% down on a property, you can buy up to $1.2 million worth of, of this right now. This is the, what the rent roll looks like and your return will be Y. And and you can just start to see your rent roll grow. I, I sat down with a guy, um, I don't know, three weeks ago. And he has 98 unit building that we're, we just started managing for him. I was like, hey, tell me your story. How'd you get here? And he's an airplane mechanic. And uh, he said, he said, you know, I started off by buying a duplex. And, uh, you know, I, every once in a while, this broker I knew who I bought this duplex was to be like, hey, it's appreciated. You should sell it. And we just did that. And so my duplex turned in 98 units. I haven't worked since I was 45. Um, and like, that's, that's, that's not a, uncommon story maybe retiring at 45 is but it's not an uncommon story to watch somebody take that duplex and flip it over and over and over again just because they had somebody paying attention to what the um the building could be or the potential could be rather than what it you know what it cash flows at at that current moment so just a thought for you guys as you're as you're looking at people and it's 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 good to ask those questions on a regular basis um, back to asset preservation, simple things, but doing larger repairs. Um, this goes back to those walkthroughs. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've walked through a unit and I've seen a 14 year old water heater in there. And I know that the owner, the owner used to live in the property and they got married and they moved in with 
your spouse and this is you know it's it's, it's not a very big money maker for makes like 100 bucks a month so i'll just tell them ahead of time hey just an fyi your water heater is going to go out sometime soon um, I don't know how in front of you want to get, if you want to wait till it pops or if you want to replace it yet, but you should start saving capital. So rather than taking that 150 bucks a month or whatever and spending it, they just start to stockpile it. And then we go ahead and replace the, uh, the water heater. Um, we talked about good cost, uh, effective ex vendors, experiences goes a long way. Um, understanding of current market costs for repairs is, is, I think that's kind of a big, a big deal too. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to call any names of any companies out there, but there's some, especially some of the plumbing companies that I know in Denver, if you call them and ask them to like, you know, Hey, I got a, an issue with my sewer. They might come out and like, Oh, we couldn't router it. We scoped it. You need a sewer replacement. And like, it might be completely inaccurate or, or it might be accurate. And you get a second opinion, uh, in a sewer scope and you find out you need to replace like an eight foot section of, of line. One company quotes you. Twelve thousand dollars. The other one com company, you know, top truck quotes you nine. What? 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 Somebody who does this every day was looking at me like, no, you should be paying thirty five hundred dollars at the very most for this, you know, or or here's another option. So I think understanding the the market cost for repairs, knowing that you can get a a furnace installed for eighteen hundred dollars versus thirty two hundred dollars is just that's just priceless when it comes to big repairs. Um. So. All that to say, I think that a lot of this is best handled by experts, people who do it all day, every day. Um, and that's not to say, I know plenty of people who are fantastic manage, self-managers, and I don't think they should switch over. And you'll know if you're that person or not. I do believe that if you have another job or if you're a flipper or something, I always look at what's the best use of your time. If you're spending five hours a week being a manager, um, and that five hour, extra hours or 10 extra hours you spend being a manager could have bought you two deals. Your your time is probably better invested in that. If you're doing a great job and it costs you no headache, don't switch over. Stick with what you're doing. Stick with what works best, you know? Um, so, yeah. Um, that's kind of it for my quick presentation. I'd go on ahead to uh, talk about Atlas a little bit if you'd like to. Uh, well, uh, so we've got one question that just popped up. And so, of course, now it seems like uh, Nick is just about done with his presentation. So if anybody else has any questions that they're maybe saving for the end, now is a perfect time because we've got about five minutes left before the hour is up. Um, and, of course, if Nick has uh, the availability, he'll stay on with us for a few more minutes after that. Um, but what was that? I said absolutely. Perfect. Uh, so here's a, a question. Can you discuss some of the biggest lessons you've learned as a PM over the years? Now, of course, that one might be uh, an entire hour, two hour <laughs> presentation in itself, but maybe you can give some highlights and uh, some other folks who are jumping in with questions. So um, looks yeah. like we'll uh, keep you busy and on the line here for a few more minutes. And we'd love it if everybody else can stick around for a few more minutes as well. You know, I think, um, wow, yeah. That could go on for days and it could be broken down into categories. I think, I think the, I'm going to say this as a new, as a new landlord, um, I think the hardest lesson that I had to learn was um, to not always become friends with my tenants uh, in, 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 in to, to treat it like a business because you start to feel for people. They tell you these stories about how their lives are changing, what's happening. And you have a big heart. Um, you wear it on your sleeve and you're like, hey, well, I'll try to work with you and blah, blah, blah. And as somebody who's been in the industry for this long, I, I, I can't say the same way, but you almost get kind of jaded to it because you just get lied to so much. So I think like I think like anytime I see a new property manager enter the business, that's probably the hardest lesson for them is like, OK, I have to this is a business. I have to replicate the same thing over and over and over again if I make exceptions. 95% of the time they don't follow through um, with the exception, so I just shouldn't. Um, you know, there are times where, where you can, but it's just, it. I think that's I think that's a hard lesson for any manager and any new manager, especially, and anybody who gets another tenants, because it doesn't feel good in any yeah. sort of way. Um, so I'd say that's, that's a very large one. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting you say that, because I, I had a tenant that I was managing for, uh, Gosh, they're probably in there for three years and they were just consistently late uh, paying rent. And I would always 
you know, they, they would give me some sob story or something and, and I would go, okay, you know, we'll make it work this month. And then the next month there's a new issue. And every time, oh, thank you. You're so good to our family. And then you, yeah, they, but they basically said the exact same thing that you just said. So, you know, here it goes from me thinking, wow, I, I'm a nice guy. I'm, I'm really caring and helping this family to how many other folks say the same exact thing to their manager every single month. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's interesting. Absolutely. It was like a direct quote. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, I think being, um, being hard and fast on your screening criteria is is something that if you're going to be uh, self landlording, you should do. Um, make sure you stick to it and look at, look look at it like a like a risk analysis rather than like uh, honestly, it's like it's better to have two weeks longer vacant than to put a bad tenant in that you wouldn't normally put in. So I think that um, that a lot of a lot of self managers will learn that. Um, eventually over time. So it's it's not worth the extra thousand bucks or 500 bucks. Just just put the right person in. Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, I got another question here. So how much advance notice do you give when increasing rents? So legally you have to give uh, a 30 day notice plus the rest of the month. So what I mean by that is if you were to like issue it on the first of the month, then that's sufficient. But if you were to issue it on the sixth of the month, you have to give 30 days plus the rest of the month. So that's like, that could be, you know, 54 days at that point in time. And that's, that's legal in Colorado, um, different in other places. Gotcha. Fair enough. I, I honestly, um, like if I'm going to do rent increases, I used to think when I first started doing this, this is another lesson I learned that if I gave like a 40 day notice, that'd be perfect because it gave them 10 days to think about it before they had to give me their notice to quit. And um, what I found is actually giving people longer to think about it usually makes them more likely to stay. So if I give them a 60-day notice, the likelihood they renew is greater than if I give them a 40-day notice. Which interesting. Intuitive. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so how much do you pay for a water heater change out in Denver? Sure. Um, so this is I, I, I when I. I'd say this has gone up significantly over the last three years as, as the cost of mains has it. We pay about 850 right now, um, which makes me sad because I used to pay 550 for it, but that's about the, that's about the common price right now for a, a 40 gallon, a 40 gallon normal water heater. If you have a, uh, a, um, a fat boy, which is like a short water heater that, you know, you might put in a crawl space or a 50 gallon or any variation on normal water heater that can fluctuate fairly well. Gotcha. Can you talk about the type of financial records you keep and provide to landlords whose properties you manage? Absolutely. Um, so we do, we use a, we, we, we created customized reports depending on the size of your portfolio, but I'll tell you what our standard is and I'll tell you about some of the mods you can make to it. So our standard is to have a, um, a t what's called a T12 in the industry or a 12 month statement. So it's a look back over the last 12 months. If you have, um, it, it's really cool because you can just like everything line items across and you can look at all the different expenses and the income rates. And if you see fluctuations in it, can, it's like a, it's like a picture of what happened over the last year. Um, we also do just a regular cash flow statement. So the, that's the in and out. Um, we do an age receiver report and a rent roll. And that's like the standard package. And any any invoices that we pay on your behalf, we attach that to your report as well. And we um, we also create an Atlas invoice that gives a more detailed response to what happened. Like you might see something that says like, that all, like a plumber's bill might say something like, you know, one half inch flex, 200 bucks. And you're like, what does that mean? And then you'll see a secondary bill um, by the way, we if it costs more than 250 bucks, we get permission for you from you on this ahead of time before we even order the work, um, unless it's an emergency. But back to that, um, so that that you get that funny bill, and you have no idea what it means from your plumber. Rather than just send that to you, you'll have a secondary invoice from your manager that just says, you know, tenant called at 11 p.m. Uh, Wednesday night and said that there was water coming out of her wall. Um, talked her through how to turn off the water to the house, called plumbing company, Plum, plumbing company came out, um, found leak and wall, cut open drywall and found two pinhole leaks, replaced two feet of copper pipe. And that, that'll be the invoice you get from the manager. So you actually get a play by play on what happened. So you're not just wondering what half inch flex means or whatever. 
Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And then um, we have uh -huh. the ability to to do a lot more with our reporting. Um, Andy Quad, our CFO, is uh, it, we use a pro program called Appfolio, which allows us to generate a ton of custom reports. Um, we have owners who have you know multi-families that they want to check in on daily to see where things are at. So if you have like a 60 or an 80 unit building and you want to see the ebb and flow of cash, he's able to turn on kind of what we'd call like a, it's a live portal, and I say live with my my bunny ear fingers because it's live as we update it. So we do billables once a week and then put them into the computer. So once a week that might see anything that we programmed and show up on their end. They're able to pull custom reports and do all that stuff, et cetera. I don't think it's necessary if you own like a single family or, or three, but once you start to getting into owning a lot of properties, it helps to be able to categorize what's happening, understand what your cash flow and your money situations look like for the next, you know, the next 45 days. Gotcha. So jumping back to that long uh, question about uh, having a bad PM, um, if there is a currently a property manager and the property is tenanted, they have a tenant in place still, um, but you need to change uh, property managers. Um, wh what do they need to know? Is there like a certain process, some things like some uh, gotchas that may get you, some things you need to look out for? Um, you're asking how to, how to break the contract with the PM or, or if you switch, what, what information needs to be relayed to the new management, what, which question I'm not totally sure. Let's hit both. Um, I think, I think if, if you're going to switch managers or try to break contract, I would say that, you know, any good PM company, if you sit down and have a, a conversation about them they're going to like let you go. But I mean, that isn't always the case. So, so review your PM contract information you want to get to your new PM. Um, so any, any owner will tell you that's had multiple PM companies that switching companies is painful because you can kind of lose some of the errant knowledge that you've developed around the property and the tenant. I mean, the bare minimal you need to get them is the security deposits, the lease, the tenant contact info, um, if you can get more like a list of repairs you've done to the property over the last few years is great. Um, move in, move out or a move in report so that they can, when the tenant moves out, they have a report of the way they moved in so that they need to prosecute them for any damages. You need that. Um, there's a, you know, the more information, the better. Um, if you have any warranties going on, some, some PM companies will know that, uh, some will, some uh, some will go really well. So like we we try to use um, we we try to use similar paint colors if we're going to repaint a whole unit so that we never have to uh, guess at what color is there for patchwork. But some PM companies will catalog if they have all different colors. They'll catalog the actual paint codes, and that can just save you a ton of money. Um, so things like that. Sure, there's a million pieces you could add into that if you kept going down the rabbit hole. Gotcha. Uh, what software do you guys use? We like Appfolio. Um, we sampled, I know we, obviously Yardi is the industry giant, but it's also a dinosaur in my opinion. I dislike it very much. We used to use that. Um, and about four or five years ago, we switched to more comprehensive, more up-to-date software. And we went through about, mm, we narrowed it down to like eight larger um, softwares. And that's the one we like most. Gotcha. Uh, somebody wanted to follow up. Uh, they thought they heard that you said you manage apartments. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. We manage um, single family. We manage condos and we manage apartments um, anywhere from, you know, a, a triplex to 120 units. Um, we have all of those under our belt right now and we've owned all those asset classes as well. So we understand them from an, from an owner standpoint. They're they're all di they're all a little bit different. So sometimes you approach them slightly different in the way you manage them, but not incredibly different. Gotcha. How do you feel about having a home warranty on rentals? Sure. Um, I get that question a lot. So I guess it depends on how long you have the home warranty for. A lot of people like to renew their home warranty year after year after year, and I don't know. I don't. I I own a bunch of rentals, and I don't have a home warranty in any of them. If it's something you like and it, you know, and it, and it feels like insurance to you, 
but I'd say absolutely you should get one. If um, the way I look at it is like, I don't know, okay, I had a water heater blow once and my home warranty, they made me pay the down payment of 60 bucks to get, um, that was my deductible or whatever. And I think my policy is worth 450 bucks or 500 bucks or something like that. And they would not let me put my own um, plumber on the project. They said they had to send one of theirs over. And their guy comes over and says it needs to be replaced, which we already knew. And then he quotes me 1275 for it. And I'm like, at the time I was getting done for like 725. And I was like, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the home warranty company told me they only cover $500 of the total cost. So I looked at it and I was like, all right, I, I finally convinced them to let me use my own plumber on it at 750. So it only cost me 300 bucks out of pocket. So it's still a win compared to paying for a regular water heater. But when I look at that compared to like the cost I paid on the home warranty, which is an additional 450 bucks, it costs the same as buying the water heater. Um, so I think it depends, you know, if you, if you want to renew them and, it, and, or you have a lot of old things in your house that you have a good policy on that can help, you know, guard against repair, like furnaces going out or, plumbing lines and stuff like that, that, that that's a different story, but it is piece to piece. I personally uh, don't carry them on any of my properties and I probably never will. Gotcha. Um, and looking like maybe this will be the last question or at least this is the last one we've got right now. Uh, yeah. Can you go back and talk more about the airplane mechanic? Uh, specifically, Andrew has a house with $100,000 in equity. Uh, are you saying sell it or tap equity as a loan to buy an additional property? Um, and so before we probably dive too deep on that one, the, yeah. there are probably, Andrew, a lot of moving parts and a whole lot of questions that we would dive into to really give you uh, a solid answer. I don't I think it's a yes, no on sell it or don't sell it or something else. But uh, Nick, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I guess I yeah I would have to know way more about it. It's, I, I wouldn't say it's as simple as a yes no. I'd say sit down with somebody you trust who's going to give you honest information, and not just try to get you to sell the property so they can make a commission on it and uh, and look at it. You know there are um, there are other factors outside of it. If you have a hundred k in equity and you're only making hundred bucks a month, it might be worth it to move it to something else. You know if you have a hundred k in equity and you're making six hundred bucks a month, you should just keep it where it is. So there's a lot of variables in that, and um, and I think sitting down with a qualified person who can who can uh, who can help you analyze whether it's better to sell or to keep it is great. I I'm happy to refer you guys to some people who can do that if you have any questions. Um, Justin can definitely get my email and phone number out afterwards, and uh, I'm ha happy to refer if you have questions along that line. So we do a quick portfolio analysis for you. Yeah, it, exactly. There's so many more questions that, that need to go into it. You know, the price point of the home, what's rents, you know, what's your mortgage if you have one and, you know, what do you want to do? What's the bigger goals you have? You know, where do you want to take this investment, you know, uh, in your portfolio? There's so many more things that go into it. And so, yeah, I mean, anybody interested, definitely reach out to Nick, reach out to myself, uh, reach out to other folks. But but you made a really great point there, Nick, that uh, yeah. just be careful who you reach out to, because, you know, if you go to your cousin who's a real estate agent, uh, they may just see dollar signs and say, oh, you're thinking about selling it? Cool, I can list that for you. You know, and they're just seeing that they're going to make a commission um, and not really helping you strategize the bigger picture of why uh, and should you and, and what are we going to do with it once you do that? So, uh, uh, and, and just for the person who asked that question, I don't know your situation, but I mean, if you bought it under a primary mortgage, you only put 5% down, you have 100K in equity in it, you're not going to want to pull it out and reinvest it into an investment property because you're going to have to put 20 to 25% down on that. But you could tap it as a HELOC, you know, and tap some of that and, and place it in other capital. So there's there's a lot of stratagem behind that and uh, I'm trying to figure out what's best for you. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things. Um, all right, another one popped up here. Uh, let's talk about uh, leases, specifically month-to-month -month versus year-long leases. Sure. Um, so we sign all of our leases, so they lapse between May and August, and we try to make them a year long. Now, if we acquire a property um, or somebody puts us on new management and they have like a vacancy in December, what we try to do is we try to lease it for 
a period will we'll again lapse between April and August, um, which is prime leasing season. So um, you start to see a really big slowdown at the end of July as school starting to come on. And then, and, and so I look at it as like, I would never, I don't like month to month leases. It's a bad thing. Somebody ditches you um, in November and you're trying to lease something over Christmas. That's just hurting you. So avoid that at all costs. Um, year long or, or multi-month is fine as long as you're getting yourself in a good spot to, to capitalize on, on the best rents and the best lead flow at the same time. Awesome. Well, Nick, it looks like we made it to the end of our questions. Uh, cool. Really appreciate your time. Uh, and of course, everybody, uh, if you want to hear more about this, you want to go back through the presentation, we're going to be putting this up on Pine Financial's YouTube page. So go to YouTube uh, and search for Pine Financial. You'll find us there. We'd love it if you would hit subscribe. We've got a ton of great videos. We're doing these webinars like this every single month. And we're also putting out uh, much shorter super uh, content dense uh, videos every Friday uh, on our YouTube page and on our Facebook page. Uh, we also have a goal for 2019 of getting a certain number of subscribers to our YouTube page. So we would really love it if you could uh, subscribe and help us hit uh, one of our goals over here at Pine Financial. So one last thing before we wrap up, Nick, why don't you t uh, share your phone number and email address quickly, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump off the call. Oh, quick, one other thing I wanted to offer. So um, I used to have people ask us to manage in places we didn't manage quite often. And so I do have a like questionnaire. If you're interviewing property managers out in another state or another area, if you want to get it for me, I, I'm happy to shoot that over to Justin and send it out to you guys. So, but yeah, my phone, my, um, my direct phone number is 719-337-5317. Um, and my email is Nick at realatlas.com. It's N-I-C-K at R-E-A-L-A-T-L-A-S.com. Awesome. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, again, if you want a copy of that uh, questionnaire that Nick has uh, for property managers, feel free and reach out to me. He's going to send that over to me. I have also put together my own list of questions that uh, help me determine that Nick was the right choice for for my properties, uh, happy to send that over as well. So thank you everyone for sharing your night with us. Again, go check out Pine Financial, uh, Pine Financial's YouTube page. And of course, if you need property management or have property management questions, feel free to reach out to Nick. And if anybody has questions uh, around or needs some hard money for their investments, that's what Pine Financial is and does all day, every day. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And we will talk to you next month.